Sometimes patience pays off in politics. It's been three years since my private member's bill for a strong, independent anti-corruption watchdog with the ability to hold public hearings passed this chamber. And it's been 14 years since the Greens first moved for there to be a federal corruption body. So uh, here we are this week. We will finally see the passage of legislation to set up a federal corruption watchdog, and boy, has it been a long time coming. The Commonwealth has been the only jurisdiction that has not had such a body. All of the states and territories now have their version of a corruption watchdog, and it's not like the Commonwealth has been free of corruption. So this is a very uh, happy and long coming day. There are few things that the Australian community is more unified on than the need for a strong, an independent, a transparent and an effective corruption watchdog. Public confidence in the integrity of Australian politicians has plummeted in recent years, and it's no mystery why. Scandal after scandal with no consequence, watching donor mates feather their nests while so many ordinary Australians struggle to make ends meet, former government ministers almost immediately popping up to spruik mining companies or banks or gambling interests after they leave parliament. When Transparency International gave Australia its lowest score ever on the Corruption Perception Index last year, it was clear that lack of progress on an integrity commission was a key factor in that terrible ranking. At the election, people voted clearly and en masse for more transparency, for more integrity, for better representation. People want an independent and a powerful watchdog that can root out corruption, that runs so rife in this place and continues to undermine our democracy. And they want that work to be done with transparency and without politicisation. Australians need to have confidence that there will be consequences when corrupt conduct is identified and, and there won't be a protection racket for politicians. As my colleague Senator Shoebridge has outlined, the Greens have been pushing to get a federal corruption watchdog for 14 years now. And as I mentioned, my bill passed uh, this chamber more than three years ago. Um, now for 10 years, we were in the wilderness uh, advocating for this idea. It was described, if my memory serves me correctly, as a niche issue by then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. It was laughed at by both of the big parties. And then 10 years after we first suggested it, it was first Labor that finally agreed, no, this is something that does need to happen. And then it took another year for the Liberal National Party to change, uh, do a 180 and say, all right, we agree that we need a federal corruption watchdog. We're happy when people get there in the end. It's a shame it had to took so long. Mm -hmm. But however, we then saw three years of obfuscation and inaction from the then Morrison government. We saw three rounds of public consultation on a draft consultation paper that miraculously didn't change from consultation to consultation. It was tokenistic consultation. Uh, it was the absolute definition of that because actually they weren't listening to what people were saying when they were consulted on the bill. Um, so that was a, a somewhat amusing uh, walk throughout history that was desperately frustrating to all involved at the time. Um, but in that 14-year history journey, I want to pay an enormous uh, gratitude and tribute to former uh, Greens, Senator Bob Brown and Senator Lee Rhiannon, who drove this issue uh, before I took over the portfolio in 2015. Um, and of course, I want to acknowledge both current and former um, independent uh, MPs, Cathy McGowan, who um, also had an excellent draft bill, and now Helen Haynes, who have collectively got us to where we are today. Now, the previous government fought tooth and nail against an effective corruption watchdog, and I wonder if that's because they knew half their cabinet would have been implicated by it. Now, I've done multiple speeches in this chamber um, where I ran out of time every time to list all of the scandals, all of the integrity uh, fracas, all of the embarrassment that so typified the previous government. And so it's no wonder that the, uh, the government at the time deprioritised this. It was delayed. It was finally presented in a form that made it clear that the governments continued to not listen to the expert contributions um, 
and that anyone with an interest in this had been saying for years. But what those experts had been crystal clear on were the key features of a strong, independent anti-corruption commission. And they are a broad definition of corrupt conduct, a broad scope that captures parliamentarians and their staff and statutory office holders and employees of government entities and contractors, strong investigative powers, the ability to act on referrals, to act on public complaints, including anonymous tip-offs, and at the Commission's own initiative, reasonable thresholds for commencing an investigation, the power to hold public hearings, the power to make findings of fact and findings of corrupt conduct, the power to report publicly, oversight by an inspector and a cross-parliamentary committee, and retrospective application. They were the key features that the experts said a corruption watchdog needed to have in order to be an effective watchdog and not one that was toothless or asleep in the kennel. Now, in opposition, the Labor government acknowledged those features, so we were hopeful when the Albanese government made integrity a key election commitment. And there is no doubt that this bill is a huge leap forward with many of those necessary features. It builds on the good work done by Greens and independents over many years. But we remain incredulous and deeply disappointed that Labor has walked back its previous commitment to public hearings, making them the exception rather than the rule. When it comes to integrity, the experience in all other jurisdictions has been that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Public hearings build public confidence in the outcomes. They act as a clear deterrent to those who think they can get away with corrupt conduct, and they provide a forum that can tease out new angles, new witnesses, new evidence that might not have come to light without public attention. The vast majority of work done by integrity commissions is done in evidence gathering and analysis and with a clear view to balancing the public interest in transparency against the risk of uh, disclosing compromising uh, things to do with an investigation and balancing that risk of undue reputational damage. Public hearings happen only after a significant body of work has been done to satisfy the commission that there is a case to answer. Commissioners are well placed to make the assessment about what is in the public interest, but the presumption should be one of transparency. We'll be moving amendments, as my colleague Senator Shoebridge has mentioned, to give the government another chance to get this right and to provide for public hearings. Now, it's, an, you know, it's a worst kept secret in this place that the deal was done with the LNP on this matter in order to secure uh, their support for this, because there's some belief that somehow um, this will make it a more longer lasting body. Well, how can you create this otherwise fantastic body that's got so much work to do and then nobble it from having public hearings? It's just unfathomable. So I urge the government to support the amendments that we will move um, to, to ensure that public hearings uh, can be had without a fetter on the discretion of the commissioners to make that decision. Um, we also need to make sure that the resources that the NAC needs to do its job um, are determined by an independent body. Leaving funding decisions to government risks the body being starved by a government who would benefit from an anti-corruption commission that's totally broke and has no teeth. An anti-corruption commission that cannot do its job is in many ways worse than none at all. The cross-parliamentary committee established under this bill is welcome, but it's not sufficiently independent of the executive. It can make budget recommendations, but funding decisions ultimately rest with government. Another key feature that is missing from this bill is clear protection for whistleblowers. My bill for a National Integrity Commission included a dedicated whistleblower protection commissioner recognising that those who expose corruption and mal maladministration can face and often do face considerable personal risks. The Attorney-General has committed to acting on the Moss Review and strengthening the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which we welcome, but it is a missed opportunity to not establish a whistleblower, whistleblower commissioner as part of NAC to ensure appropriate support, advice, representation and protection for people disclosing misconduct. Finally, I want to talk about cleaning up politics. Of course, we need a federal anti-corruption watchdog and we will be supporting this bill, but a federal NAC is not enough. The NAC won't stop pork barrelling or breaking the stranglehold of corporate influence on politics. It won't stop the revolving door between industry and political parties. It won't be enough on its own to give the community confidence that politicians are acting in the public interest 
not their own interests. We need a comprehensive plan to clean up politics from the start, not just to deter corruption at the very end. We need to get the influence of big money out of politics. Last week, I reintroduced my bill to ban donations from dirty industries and to cap all other political donations to $1,000 per year. We also need to lower the donation disclosure thresholds and make, donations in, make, make them public in real time so people can see who is seeking to influence decisions. We also need election spending caps so elections aren't bought by those with the deepest pockets. We desperately need to lift parliamentary standards with a strong code of conduct for all MPs and senior staff, which we're making some progress on, and we need to strengthen the lobbying code. We need to publish ministers' diaries. And we need to make sure that freedom of information laws actually disclose information affordably and meaningfully. We need to stop the revolving doors and the golden escalators by extending the cooling off period for former ministers taking on cushy roles in industries they used to allegedly regulate for five years, not the unenforced 12 to 18 months that it currently is. And we desperately need a more diverse parliament that represents our community. We also need to remove barriers to public servants and dual citizens running for election. We need increased public engagement in parliamentary debate, and we need strong support for protest and public advocacy. Everyone benefits from honesty, transparency and accountability in politics. Everyone except dodgy politicians. The community deserves a genuinely representative parliament with integrity, one that acts in the public interest, not just the interests of politicians, big corporations and the super rich. I welcome this bill as a huge step towards that goal and I look forward to working with the government on getting the rest of the way there. And uh, whilst I began the speech by saying that patience pays off, I am running out of patience.